Hi, welcome to the third Milan Video Tech Meetup event. Today's topic will be a 360 degrees view on video piracy. Last time we had an event on all you want to know about video KPIs and this time we will do on video piracy. If you have any questions, send a message to QA, uh, Stefano Morello, he will reply to all the questions in the Zoom chat. So let's introduce now the speakers and agenda. Um, let's see how we can tell more about video piracy during this session. Thank you. And the next speaker that I would like to introduce is uh, Matteo. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, I am the head of technology operations in Chile. So I'm responsible for uh, the whole platform development and the for the Chile service, which is a OTT service for consumers in uh, transactional GOD mode. Uh, we are available in five countries, mainly in Italy, but also in other countries of Europe. And we are building a service for streaming. Nice, thank you, Matteo. And the last speaker that I would like to introduce is uh, Steve. Hi, I'm Steve Epstein. I work for Cinemedia, I'm a distinguished engineer. I'm focusing on a lot of the strategy and, and our new solutions, innovative solutions for anti-piracy. And I'll be happy to present uh, the landscape of anti-piracy in the OTT world. Thank you, Steve. And for myself, uh, my name is Andrea, and I'm a CUN consultant, and you can reach out to me at videodeveloper.io. But enough with introductions, uh, let's make a start. So I will uh, give up the control to Ilker, who will be starting, and to first give uh, an overview of what we're gonna talk about. So our first, uh, we gave an introduction to the meetup and the previous event. The first topic that we will be uh, presenting is video piracy at 360 view, what the threats are by Ilker. Then we're gonna have a quick Q&A session where you can reach out to Stefano Morello if you have any specific questions. Uh, then we're gonna have a presentation by Matteo on security in smart TV consumer devices. And at the end, likewise, we will have a QA session. And the last but not least is uh, Steve with how the video security world is changing from broadcast to OTT. And also after his session, we will have a QA. So I'll pass it on to Ilker now. And he, looking forward to hear it. Sorry, gentlemen, something is falling somewhere. I don't know. Um, uh, all good. We are safe. Uh, thanks a lot um, for handing over. <laughs> Perfect timing for breaking things here in my room. <laughs> Welcome to the world of COVID. And by the way, while we talk COVID, I have a cold. It's not COVID. I have done a test, so all safe. Um, please bear with me if my sound is, um, it may come a little bit weird over the ether. Uh, today, I would like to tell you more about the extent and impact of video piracy, and we will talk about uh, the basics, who are these guys, what motivates them, and how do they attack and distribute content. And then I would like to give you a 360 security posture, how to combat piracy from um, a CDN's perspective, from Akamai, we as a security company also. We see this as a protect, so we protect whatever we can, we detect uh, whatever you cannot protect and uh, we enforce uh, whatever you detected or we detected in a joint way. And then finally, we will have a community session. Let's dive in. What we see communicated in the world. Um, 52 billion lost to piracy. This is a lot. Piracy killed the TV industry. Mm. Pirate gangs make millions. Video piracy is the cause of all evil in the world. Yeah, would you agree? I would say, why not? Yeah, because um, let's go a little bit back to the history. When did pirates have had their own golden age? If you look at the Wikipedia, we can say it's 1690 to 1730. And um, isn't it fun that we can also correlate evil to money? So 
okay, look at for the monetary perspective. The goldsmiths in England, they have been craftsmen, bullion merchants, uh, money changers, money lenders since the 16th century. And the first European banknotes, they have been issued by uh, Stockholm's Banco in 1661. Isn't it funny if you now reflect this behavior into nowadays? Do you see a correlation between Bitcoin and online crime? Well, that's not our topic. Sorry, but I just wanted to remind you what we're talking about. Okay, let's proceed. Um, next, here we go. The extent of video piracy. <clears throat> Here, things get interesting. <laughs> there are several studies out in the wild and these studies are driven by industry bodies. They are commercial, they are uncommercial. Um, and they differ, it depends on where you look on from which perspective into which countries you're looking at. If at the higher range, range um, we see like 8.9% or 9% um, the top population being in Netherlands and Sweden compared to 0 0.7 or 1.3 range in Romania and Bulgaria. So this study has been done by European Intellectual Property Office, a EUIPO, and they have found that um, 57% of the total revenue um, has been made by un unauthorized IPTV subscription providers. Um, <coughs> then if we proceed uh, with the research uh, which are out in the field, there is another uh, research done by the University of Amsterdam. Um, they did this in, in Asia Pacific. The picture is again is different. Like in the upper range, 65% of the internet population in, for example, in Thailand is pirating. Whereas in Japan, it's 12%. So why, why is that different? Because for the, for the Thai people or for the Philippines, where this is also very high at 54%, um, the expectation is, hey, TV is free. When I buy a device, I get access to the content and it's free. Yeah. Now you might see a similarity if I buy a box on the internet, an illicit streaming device, I, put it, I plug it into the internet, hey, it's free. I mean, that's, that's kind of the expectation what the people have, so they, they don't believe that, that they are doing something wrong. And now look like into the MENA region, yeah, like 53 to 59% of uh, piracy is happening there. This is like the top range. Well, this is the place where um, piracy is now has been industrialized, thank to be out Q. This is unbelievable. You can buy a BLQ box, um, plug it into the internet. They have their own app stores. You get a sophisticated experience. These guys are now um, competing against like, like official um, service providers. They are neighbors in the BEIN. They are not happy about that. And um, if you just Google for BLQ, you know what I'm talking about. Let's proceed. This was the extent and what is the impact of video piracy? Um, one billion per annum. This is what the piracies are doing or generating as revenue in you during 2018. I mean, this was like two years ago. Imagine what this is um, nowadays. Um, just to give you a number, um, COVID happened. Still, we are in between. And especially uh, in, um, in Italy, uh, the piracy numbers, they increased like, um, uh, FAPAO have done a study and increased from 69 million during the average quarter in 2019 to 243 million during the two months of the pandemic. It's like, wow. And then, you know, you can imagine once you are in this game, you get used to it, it will be tough to go out of this game, to be honest. Um, then, yeah. What is the real big issue is that jobs are getting killed. So uh, there is a US study. Um, it is from the um, US economy and they have done a research and they believe that between 230,000 and 560,000 jobs are getting killed. And FAPAO has done a similar research in Italy, like they see in 2017, 6,000 people might have lost their jobs due to COVID. And if you reflect that number in the European regions in, in Germany, Spain, or France, it might be even higher. So that is a fact, and we have to create awareness around that. Um, and then the piracy is also impacting the value of the rights. So let's go into the MENA region, so where piracy is like industrialized, right? Um, 
why should I pay for the rights so much money if my neighbor can watch it for free? So there is no value for the content. So this is one part of one side of the sort. But if you look at from the content owners, um, well, why should I give my content to you when you get let get it pirated? So there is it's 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 kind of a disruptive situation and things are happening. Let's see where this journey will go into or how we can change it in the long run that we find an arrangement between these parties as vendors, as, as joint vendors. Um, yes, <laughs> who are the pirates? Uh, yeah, do you know these guys? Um, have you ever been the pirate pay? <laughs> I'm sure you did. Um, uh, Peter Sunde, Frederick Neich, uh, I don't know if I spell it right, Gottfried Svartholm, they are the co-founders of Pirate Bay. Do they look like millionaires? No. They do it for a reason because they can do it and they believe they do it for a right reason because they are seen as the Robin Hood of um, the internet. So they take it from the rich people and give it to the poor. Uh, to the young people who love content while they can't get access to the content. Um, and then, you know, the, the interesting thing is when um, Frederick Ney came out of the prison, um, he said it was well worth doing prison time when you consider how much the site means to people. So they believe in what they do. It is the, we talk about the release groups here. So the release groups, they are at the top of the virus groups. The virus groups, they are like their own community. They have their own hierarchies. They have their own laws. They have their own committees. They have their own, um, even their own standards like the IEEE. They define how to publish content. Um, and then they do it like, hey, this is like kind of altruism here, what we're talking about. And um, after the release groups, there is another group, the site operators. So the cyber lockers and the streaming sites where you have access to the content. These people, they have different motivators. Yes, they want to make money and they want to get their malware out in the field so that they can make even more money. Um, that's the main driver. And some people say that the release groups are the same people with the virus groups. Um, Oh, sorry, the, the, the site operators and the release groups are kind of sitting in the same boat. Um, and then we have another group, which, or who are the internet streaming device wholesalers, right? right? When you, um, from the Asian perspective, hey, when I buy a box, put it in the internet, that's free. Yes, these are the guys, um, you can buy it everywhere. Go to Amazon, Alibaba, just click IPTV. I've done this um, just a test last week. Hey, I want to buy an IPTV box. Can you um, give me a test signal? Within two minutes, I got a response to an M3U playlist, which I could plug into a Firebox with a Kodi and being able to play it for 24 hours. So I could do, in theory, um, uh, kind of subscription stacking with these guys and could watch for years. Um, so that's possible today. Uh, and then um, there's obviously the, there are the amateur pirates out there like uh, me and you, sorry, not like me, but more like you who are putting their cameras on the screens and sharing that through um, social platforms. That's another group of pirates. So we know who the pirates are. Let's proceed because time is running and I want to tell you so much more. Um, how do these, now let's answer the questions. Okay, how do these guys get access to the content and then how do they distribute it? There are a lot of ways, or we could talk hours about that. Uh, the various groups, they hacked like the DRM systems, they reversed engineer it, they know how it works so that they can get access to the content and then they make it publicly available to their cyber lockers or, um, or or streaming sites, right? And there are man little middle attacks. Um, signal hijacking is happening and in, in satellites potentially, and uh, most importantly, system hijacking, where people get access to production suites, su suites and, and, and copy the content from directly there on site or from the cloud. Um, yeah, um, or an HTCP stripper, right? You plug it into an encoder and there you go, you have, direct access and the content where HTTP from the HDMI output is being killed or password sharing um, or credential stuffing. We will talk more about that in the coming slides. Um, I hope that gives you a nice overview. My, my colleagues might also talk about that in the next couple of slides. Um, okay, how is Akamai um, helping against media privacy? So how do we approach um, tackling this? 
Now we have, let's say, three pillars. We want to protect our customers' content, um, or they protect it through us. And then we would like to um, detect what is being not able to protect it. So we have we rely on intelligence and partners who are cooperating with us to be able to detect that. And then the enforcement is the same. Let's dive into what we mean with protect, detect, and enforce. Nice words, but let's see some action behind it. Here we go. Oh, that was too fast. Um, protect, stop piracy from happening. Yes, um, how can we do this? We recommend protect against credential stuffing. Um, Use anti DDoS protection. So, this will help you prevent like big bots trying to attack your backend and trying to find backdoors and get your content, right? Um, or write secure um, codes within your um, login endpoints. So, write, um, apply OWASP best practices. This is what, what we are recommending to our customers um, against credential stuffing. Protect against content theft, so theft from systems, so direct hacking or man in the middle attacks, um, they have to be protected and the theft by employees and, and freelancers, they have to be protected or simply um, protect against um, like stealing from, from uh, the unique system IDs such as passwords. We recommend employing a zero trust framework. What do we mean with that? Um, so zero trust means complete opposite of what people are have been doing for a long time. Trust simply no one. Give everyone dedicated access by looking into his device posture. Give him access on a specific port for a specific application for a specific time if he's a freelancer so that you can control it. Um, and, and Zero Trust is also implementing system that proactively identify and block um, like big threats such as malware or ransomware or phishing activities. So zero trust is something which you should think and consider about if you are producing content like in the cloud or even the broadcasters of the future who are thinking about uh, doing remote production. Um, yeah, this is a next challenge where they are or they will be facing or they are facing right now at the moment. Protect against playback infringement. Um, typically, uh, let's say most prevalent being digital threat management. And my friend Matteo, he will tell you more, more about that, how this can be implemented. Um, protect, sorry, protect against geo and IP rights infringement. So yeah, the attackers, if they don't have access to the content in the country where they are living, they will try to get um, access through VPNs. I'm sorry. Um, and then there are um, solution providers out there, uh, like us, who are able to detect these VPNs, Tor exit nodes, anonymous proxies, um, who are giving the, uh, you access um, through hosting service providers. And we are able to detect them and then we can stop them or redirect them or just create awareness that content is coming from these, um, these regions. Um, let's, now we have protected our content. Um, if it's not able to be protected, yeah, obviously we have to detect it by um, having intelligence underneath. What do we mean? with detection or what can help us detect? First of all, we need to detect the content and their fingerprinting will help us. Fingerprinting will help us detecting what's being pirated. It is not changing the content itself. Um, and then there is content watermarking. Contra content watermarking, there are different flavors like uh, bitstream modification, AB watermarking or client-side watermarking. I will not touch deep in these um, capabilities, but there is a lot of technology out there which helps with scalable um, implementation of content watermarking, like we are working with the major vendors out in the market, for example. Um, content watermarking applies a watermark. It's like a tattoo which you put on top of the content um, so that we can identify who is sharing the content. Last but not least, we would like to recommend doing kind of stream monitoring. If you push your content through a service provider or a CDN, then the CDNs, they have insights into who are 
requesting the content and how they are requesting the content. They see the user agents, they see the behaviors, they also get a fingerprint of that requested content from the end user. So they have the abilities to analyze what's being requested. They see the tokens, they see how much these tokens are being requested. So they will give you a good insights into what's going on within your Pyra situ situation. Um, next, um, hold on. Enforcement, yes. Now we have been able to detect people are getting access, access to the protected content. Now we have to give them the ability to protect access to this content. How can you do this? We recommend access revocation. Access revocation means, um, yeah, content has been authorized. It's been made available for playback. That means normally there is a token behind it in the CDN world or in the media distribution world when we distribute content through the web. Um, a token um, has also a correlation to a watermark, for example. So if we detect a watermark, then this watermark information might be in the token. And then we might be able to detect that token while we detected the watermark. So we can say, you know what, that token, let's kill it. You will not be able to watch it. Um, on the other hand, we recommend making use of real-time messaging through social platforms. Hey, it's easy to put my camera here, right, and then put it on social platforms and then stream it. And while I'm doing this, hey, Pete, look, uh, I'm watching uh, the tennis match or Milan versus Madrid. Then uh, a message pops up. Oh, hold on. Uh, someone's, what? I'm doing illegal stuff. Uh, hey, Pete, I have to go down. Sorry, the game is over. <laughs> that, that helps, trust me. And the people know they have tested it. And by the way, then these kind of messaging are opening the doors to send them. Hey, by the way, um, while you're doing this, we give you a voucher. You get the service even um, for 10 bucks easier for the first couple of months. Um, stream modification is another method. Let's say I'm watching um, content through pirated uh, platforms. Um, now the vendor has the ability to flip the coin and change the content. Now I'm watching Milan versus Madrid. You know what? I'm going to send them the match from last year. Hey, there is gun your user experience. Me as a pirate, what am I watching here? I pay money for these guys and they are showing me the, the football match from last year. Oh, go away. So that's in, that's about you know, disrupting the user experience, um, that could be also a solution, to be honest. Um, how much time has gone? I'm talking too much. I hope that's, I have some time for the bonus. Um, I would like to make a, um, a fingerprinting versus motor watermarking story for you guys. It's like uh, fingerprinting versus watermarking for dummies because I had issues with it in the beginning. So what the heck, it's, it's all the same. Why? Um, let me tell you. This is Jack, and Jack has a fingerprint, and Jack is a clone, and he is living on planet Mustafar, and Jack lives only on planet Mustafar. And someone hijacks Jack from Mustafar. And someone is cloning Jack. Why? Because he wants to make money with Jack in other, uh, on other planets, for example, right? So, yeah. And then <laughs> police detects a clone of Jack on planet Bespin because they know Jack can only be on Mustafar. How the heck is he coming here? So um, Jack knows um, this guy belongs to the Dark Lord. Hey, Dark Lord, this is Jack. Is this your Jack? Yes, but who cloned him? Someone. Find someone or I'll find you. So you see, they have now a problem. They have to find who is cloning Jack. Okay, guys, we have a problem. Let's think about how we could solve it. So we have his fingerprint. We know we can find out that he's somewhere. So someone cloned him. But how do we know who cloned him? Hmm, whoever wants to see Jack will get protocoled. Okay. We will tattoo him so we know whom he had contact with. Yeah. And then next day, knock, knock. Hey, it's me, Peter, I wanna see Jack. Hey, write down, Peter wants to see Jack with the snake tattoo, and only Jack with the snake tattoo being visited by Peter, okay? So someone, who is Peter again, <laughs> hijacks Mustafar, but he didn't realize that he has a tattoo. Maybe this tattoo is invisible. Now Peter is cloning Jack. 
say, <laughs> and he's doing the same thing on, on Alderaan. Huh, the police now detects the clone of Jack on planet Alderaan. Now they see, hey, this is Jack. Yes, this is his fingerprint. Now look, he's tattooed. You remember the guy, Pete, who wanted to see Jack? That must be him. And they go to Dark Lord. Hey, is this your Jack? Yes, but who cloned him? Someone who is Peter. Welcome to the dark side. Here we go. I hope that this story is helping you to understand the principles of fingerprinting. It's allowing us to identify clones of Jack anywhere in the galaxy. In the media world, it allows us detecting the content anywhere in the internet. But it does not tell us who has cloned Jack. And watermarking, just to repeat, is a kind of the tattooing mechanism. It is allowing us to identify clones of Jack who had contact with known people anywhere in the galaxy. So in the media world, it allows us detecting the pirate who cloned the content anywhere in the internet. I hope um, that was um, in time. And with that, I would like to keep it up for questions. Okay, you can um, ask to, to Stefano. And one question that uh, I'll ask you that came to me when, when mm -hmm. you were speaking, what is the most diffuse or most used method that you see uh, from a CDM point of view of um, pirating content from the ones that you highlighted earlier on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see um, it's a good um, mixture. We have abilities, you know, to detect average number of tokens. We see we can, you know, um, analyze the request coming into our um, CDN and see if there is an average average user will generate, let's say, 25 tokens, right? And if someone is requesting hundreds of tokens, then this token is being shared. So that gives us a good hint of what's happening. Or we also see a lot of um, user agents coming from really Linux machines or Kodi boxes. So this is also giving us a good hint of someone is trying to get content in an unnatural way. So this is also giving us a hint um, what's what's going on. And sometimes we see um, like um, yeah, service providers, like hosting service providers accessing content. So that means, okay, why should a hosting provider ask for content, right? Um, that helps us also to detect um, or get, let's say, an initial set of um, insights into what's happening with our customers' content. And in the long run, um, I hope, that we might be implementing maybe one day fingerprinting capabilities. So we are able to detect what's leaving or we are able to create a fingerprint of each and every content which is leaving Akamai. So we know one day if that content is somewhere in Bespin or Alderaan, we know um, what's going on. Nice, thank you. And we have one more question is, is it mandatory uh, to have DRM when doing watermarking? Um, I don't think so, no. <laughs> you could do watermarking without DRM. Um, then your content is simply not protected. But again, yes, um, yes, there are HDMI, HDCP strippers out there, which does exactly that. Um, but yeah, in theory, yes, this is possible. But you should make sure that you have kind of access control so you know um, whom is con whom is a given access to the content. Okay, thank you. Very explanatory. Uh, if there are no more questions for now, I will pass the ball to the next speaker, uh, who is going to be uh, Matteo. So uh, feel free to Hello. press the screen. Hello. And I'll prove it. Uh, thank you, Matteo. You have the stage. Thank you. So just a couple of information um, from what I do. Uh, we are a company which uh, has an um, OTT service uh, in five countries, five European countries, so Italy, Germany, UK, Poland, and Austria. And uh, we are a transactional VOD only model, so only pay-per-view. So it's really important for us to protect the content because we have the, the first window of, uh, of uh, distribution after the theaters. Um, we are also present on all the smart TV models, so we will focus uh, mainly on smart TV consumer devices also uh, and web browser. And we will go technically in the details on how it works, the content protection. So um, 
the first thing is um, how we deliver content to the users. Uh, there are many different protocols for streaming content to the users. Uh, ten, ten years ago or more, there were common protocols uh, based on IP, native protocols such as RTP, RTMP. Uh, then the market moved away from these uh, native protocols and uh, switched to protocols based on HTTP. Why? Because uh, this simplifies a lot uh, uh, the network infrastructure and uh, uh, it's uh, easily scalable because it can be easily cached on CDN also. So the most commonly used protocols today are the Microsoft Smooth Streaming, Apple HLS, and MPEG Dash. Um, the Smooth Streaming protocol and MPEG Dash share the same fragmented MP4 files uh, on the, on, under the cover. So it's uh, quite easy to make it possible to stream the same uh, uh, encoded and encrypted content using two different protocols. Uh, Apple HLS originally supported only MPEG transport stream files, but on 2016, Apple announced support also for fragmented MP4 files. So it's now possible to use HLS using the same set of fragmented MP4 files together with smooth streaming and MPEG dash. So this is really important because the content is uh, uh, uses a lot of space and is really expensive storing this information on the CDN. So allowing to have a single set of underlying media files which can be used by uh, all those protocols uh, helps reducing cost and simplifies the, the whole infrastructure. So mm, the next point is uh, how can we secure the video content? Uh, what is done is typically is doing encryption of the content. So we encrypt the content, but then we need to uh, allow the legitimate users to, to decrypt this content in a secure way. Uh, how is done this? We are using a DRM technology. So the DRM technology has multiple purposes. Uh, mainly, it needs to verify that the content uh, can be decrypted by that user so that the user is legitimate and uh, uh, it checks also that the device is not compromised so it cannot be um, st stolen the content from that device. So uh, what's important to note is that the DRM is secure as long as nobody can capture the content or can read the encryption key because if you uh, are able to read the encryption key uh, either during or after license exchange, you will be able to decrypt the content, the original content. Uh, there are different technologies uh, that are used and depends on devices and on hardware uh, capabilities. So uh, on modern devices, uh, there is uh, what is called a protected media path directly implemented in hardware. So it's not possible to um, intercept the encryption key uh, during the license exchange or during decryption because this travels in a secure way in hardware. So even if you can access the system memory, you are not able to read the encryption key. And this is the typical case of mobile devices, uh, modern mobile devices, smart TVs, uh, and also some browsers such as Edge and Safari. Uh, it's not always possible to do this. So on older devices or in other cases, the decryption has to be done via software. In this case, obviously, there is a much higher risk that an attacker can read the memory uh, and uh, so decrypt the, uh, the content using the key. There are many different techniques that DRM uses to prevent this. And obviously, the risk still exists, but uh, DRM have, have, uh, has evolved to uh, avoid these, uh, these things like uh, implementing device blacklisting, code and memory obfuscation, uh, key rotation, and so on. So usually also on these devices, the streaming quality is limited. So there is no 4K, sometimes there is no even HD. So that even if an attacker can uh, capture the content, it will have only a lower quality content. But now, the point is how we mix together the streaming protocol and the DRM. Um, usually, smooth streaming, uh, since it's a Microsoft solution, is coupled with the Microsoft Play ready DRM. Apple HLS is coupled with Apple Fair Play. And MPEG Dash, which is an open standard, is usually coupled with uh, Google Widevine and or Microsoft Play ready. 
Uh, these are the only the most commonly deployed combination. It is possible also to use, for example, HLS with white vine and other combination or other DRM. But this is what uh, uh, we usually see. Um, in particular, the, the point is that we need uh, all of them to cover all the, the OTT scenarios because uh, Apple HLS plus Fair Play is the only option on Apple devices which is supported natively. Otherwise, you have to use uh, um, additional libraries and it may not support all the devices. Smooth streaming uh, had a lot of support from TV vendor at the beginning. So many smart TVs only support smooth streaming. And while MPEG Dash is uh, usually uh, used on, on web browser and newer smart TVs and uh, Android models. So just to, to recap what we've said, so we can see that the closed Apple ecosystem works with HLS and Fairplay, both on iOS, Apple TV, and Safari. Uh, then we have a much more um, a distributed ecosystem. So we can have MPEG Dash and Smooth Streaming as protocols, which can mix together Widevine and PlayReady as DRM. Uh, in particular, all the Google products usually support uh, Google Widevine, Microsoft products supports uh, uh, play ready and then there are a lot of other devices which can share both of the DRM or protocols. Smart TVs uh, stays here in the spot uh, in the central spot but uh, it doesn't mean that every smart TV supports everything uh, it's um, more the opposite so each smart TV supports one or more streaming protocol and one or more uh, DRM system. For example, also at the same, in the same um, vendor field, for example, if you take Samsung, Samsung at, has its older uh, smart TV models based on its older platform, which are able to use only smooth streaming with PlayReady. Then we have the Tizen OS from Samsung, which covers uh, uh, also MPEG Dash support, but uh, Google Widevine modular DRM is supported only from 2016. So Tizen model from 2015 supports only PlayReady. And uh, this is only Samsung. There are uh, tens of uh, different uh, uh, vendors for smart TV which supports uh, one or more of this combination. So uh, there is also an additional pain point in this scenario because uh, even uh, if we reported that uh, uh, all of these protocols, streaming protocols, supports fragmented MP4, and all of them uses uh, AES 180-bit, 128-bit uh, uh, for the encryption. Uh, there are two possible block cipher mode of operation. So uh, CTR, which is the counter mode, was the default for Microsoft PlayReady and Google Widevine since the beginning. Uh, CBCS is the only one supported scheme from Apple Fair Play. So even if uh, uh, PlayReady since version 4 and Google Widevine uh, supports now also CBCS, uh, older devices do not. So uh, you still need to cover all these scenarios two different encryption of each content, which means you either need to uh, use double the space required for your content or use a dynamic packaging system which uh, encrypts on the fly the content depending on the, on the client which is requesting. Uh, the worst thing is that this is not going to change uh, in the short to mid term, mainly because of smart TV. So if you need to support smart TV models, uh, you will need to support the CTR mode anyway, because uh, usually smart TV are not getting upgraded. So uh, if a smart TV comes out with uh, only CTR support, it will uh, die with CTR support. So if you want to support this, uh, uh, you will need, still need CTR. Uh, then we, we are going to talk a bit about player types because uh, there uh, is a quite complex ecosystem of player types. So we can now um, uh, uh, split the player types in two categories. So web-based application, which runs in a web browser, and native application. Um, now, there are two types of players, uh, native players. Native players uh, supports directly the streaming protocol. So uh, every platform usually support uh, streaming from a, uh, or playing a content from an MP4 file directly. And usually uh, platform supports one or more streaming protocol natively. Uh, 
for example, uh, uh, Apple Heavy Player on the iOS supports uh, streaming HLS natively. Uh, also, Safari on iOS, uh, which is an HTML-based application uh, using video tag with the encryption uh, uh, support, can um, stream directly HLS. And also, custom native players, usually on smart TV, supports one or more of these protocols, such as MPEG Dash, Smooth Streaming, or HLS. And then we have the other category, which uh, uh, is uh, devices which uh, uh, expose lower level APIs. So these lower level APIs are used to, to feed directly byte stream to the decoder. So you will not have a player already supporting natively the streaming protocol, but you will have the capability to feed directly the data to the media decoder. So this is the case, for example, with the media source extension in web browsers. Um, also, uh, Android exposed through the media codec API these functionalities. In this case, uh, you will need uh, to build a player, which is much more complex, because it needs to implement the streaming protocols also. But there are lots of uh, open source or commercial player using these features, for example, Shaka Player or Dash.js. Uh, for web-based application or the Android Dexo player project uh, sponsored with, by Google for this. So what, what are the pros and cons of these, these two options? So native players are easy to implement. Usually you give the player the URL of the streaming protocol of the manifest, and then you will probably need to have uh, uh, the DRM part support, but it's quite easy to, to add this. The cons is that uh, you, are, um, you can use only the protocol which is natively supported by the player. So if the player support only HLS, you will not be able to use MPEG Dash or Smooth Streaming. Uh, each device may have its own implementation, especially, this is true especially on smart TVs. There are also consortiums like uh, HBB TV, Open IPTV Forum and so on, which provide some common specification. But we, what we see typically is that uh, for each vendor, you will need to customize the player to make it work. And it's not extensible, as we have said. So uh, you can't add a new feature, even if a newer version of the protocol supports. So for example, I think HLS has reached version eight, but if the device comes out with a version for support, you will not be able to use features later added on. Uh, this is the best scenario. The worst scenario is that uh, you will also have problem playing back the content with an older client. While on the lower level APIs player, you can implement any streaming protocol. So you can build a player which supports MPEG Dash or HLS or whatever you want because uh, you, can, uh, you can build the player yourself. Also, the streaming features can be upgraded. So if tomorrow's um, a new version of HLS or uh, MPEG Dash, ad adds new functionalities, you can later extend the player. Uh, the Q quality of service can also be improved. So for example, the adaptive bitrate algorithm may be tuned or customized or improved. So what we've seen is that um, the adaptive bitrates uh, algorithm, especially on TVs, behave very differently. So in some cases, TVs are very slow to respond to bandwidth change. Uh, on other cases, are very fast. So this can have impact on buffering or uh, uh, freezing the content or quality switching. And the other pro is that uh, media source extension has been standardized on HTML5. So uh, as long as the web browser implement MSA, you will, you will have a, a player which runs on all the browsers. The bad thing is that uh, the block cipher mode we have seen before, so CTR or CBCS is handled directly by the, uh, the decryptor, which is not uh, something you can control. So even if you could uh, uh, build a new player using a different streaming protocol, if the device only supports, for example, CTR or CBCS, you will not be able to use the other block cipher uh, mode, so the encryption um, mechanism on those devices. So now we can see, for example, what happens on a typical player built in a browser with a media source extension and the encrypted media extension. So you have your JavaScript application, which connects to your backend server and retrieves the URL of your content, of your manifest. 
with the proper protocol and also the entitlement so the right of the user to watch the content then you feed this information in the javascript player for example shaka player which is then responsible to perform two things the first one is that it parses the manifest implements the protocol so it will perform requests to the cdn to download video and audio chunks and send them to the browser through the media source extension and this is what happens at all if the content is not protected so there is no drm if there is drm then you will need also to uh, integrate the support for the encrypted media extension so the browser will detect that the content is encrypted will send out a callback to the player uh, to ask for a license then your player will contact your license server and will send the, uh, key requ the, the request for the license with the entitlement embedded in it and then after you get the license you send back to the encrypted media extension which then parses the license uh, with the, the content decryption module which is uh, uh, supported by the browsers. So the content decryption module is actually the uh, implementation of a specific DRM, such as Widevine or PlayReady or FairPlay, which is responsible then for decrypting the content. So with this, we close with uh, also the player part. Uh, I want to spend just a couple of words on studio and distributors compliance. So to get uh, uh, content, uh, especially premium content, you usually need to perform some certifications, at least with big studios. So they want to check that you have a workflow uh, that is secure and that you have implemented security on devices and your servers. Uh, in the past, uh, Mm, this requires uh, usually a certification for each single device model. So if I wanted to support Samsung TVs, I had to file a request to be able to stream to Samsung TVs and then for all of the other vendors. And they also posed a lot of constraint um, on this, uh, such as required per using watermarking on 4K or blocking HD on devices, which they do not require, uh, consider enough secure. So obviously this impacted negatively both the user experience and uh, the cost to build the platform. Uh, this model was designed in the set-top box era. So uh, a vendor of set to box had to certify his, um, his service once because they had a single box uh, um, for his service. Now we are moving in an OTT space, so this uh, was really complex, at least for companies like us, to get all the certification. But now the market is changing because uh, uh, the DRM solutions we have seen are widely accepted and deployed today, and they come from the three biggest company in the field, so Apple, Microsoft, and Google. And so the process is, uh, has been streamlined. Also, we can consider that, um, also because of the pandemic, uh, there are new business models arising, uh, which uh, did not require additional certification steps. For example, Universal decided to distribute some of its uh, most newest content directly in streaming without passing to the theaters because they were closed. So instead of delaying the release of new films, they decide, the movies, they decided to uh, directly provide this content uh, for the first time directly um, to services like us. And uh, the results are interesting. For example, Trolls World Tour uh, made more money in the first three weeks of digital release than during five months in theaters they did with the previous chapter of the same uh, of the same uh, series so obviously this is a uh, particular content because it's uh, targeted to families and so probably it uh, um, it, it performed well because of the pandemic so maybe other titles uh, have different uh, rules but this uh, this is also changing in the industry so this is a probably deep change which will uh, remain after even after the, the pandemic. So that's all from my side. If you have any question, I'm here. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Matteo. So we have one question and that's, uh, did you see more piracy during the COVID-19 period? 
So uh, what we have seen is that uh, our service increased a lot. So we more than doubled the number of streams we have seen and we have acquired a lot of new customers. So uh, it's difficult to see, to, to know at least from our point if the content was more parated or not. Uh, but from the, from the service point of view, I think that uh, this has helped a lot to make awareness in the consumers that there are alternatives and that these alternatives works. So uh, also, even if the prices are not low, for example, Trolls World Tour was released uh, at uh, 15.99 euros for uh, rental only for 48 hours. And we sold a lot of those because uh, uh, many families probably stuck at home <laughs> wanted to make uh, their children uh, watch something. <laughs> For sure, that, that everyone uh, can uh, can enjoy. Okay, so that's very interesting to hear, and, and it's good also for for your business, I guess. So that's good, and uh, we will now move on to our last presentation, and it will be uh, by Stephen uh, Steve Epstein. So if you wanna take control, then uh, the floor is yours. Uh, Steven, you're mute. So I'm unmuting. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. So I'm Steve Epstein. I'm a distinguished engineer in, in, in uh, Cinemedia. And I'm going to present today a lot about what Ilker and what Matteo talked about before in terms of what are the threats involved for new OTT providers. OTT providers are typically service providers which only distribute over the open internet using ABR protocols, uh, service providers such as Netflix and Amazon Prime and the likes. I'm gonna talk a little about, about the US market, but it's applicable to Asian markets and Europe markets as well. So if you look at OTT providers, you can break them down and segment the marketplace, typically into two different categories. One category is exclusive content versus non-exclusive content aggregators. And exclusive content is typically what's called a direct-to-consumer provider. Someone like in uh, MLB.com or NFL Gate Pass or in Europe, English Premier League or La Liga or Bundesliga. These are content providers that have content and want to distribute it direct to consumer. Um, on the other hand, there are content aggregators who are providers who don't have their own content. They don't own content, but they just aggregate other people's content and they provide their users a breadth of content typically from other content owners. Within the exclusive content and the content aggregated space, they're live, which are typically um, mainly live sports, um, but potentially um, could be entertainment as well, who, who show live content direct to consumer, um, while many of the, or most of the OTT services are typically on demand, whether it's series content or movies, where the consumer at his own free time will decide to watch the content um, that he desires. Um, while live content, he has to watch it um, during the, the, live, the live streaming times, um, and then it won't be offered any other time. So, so again, you have a segment of exclusive versus non-exclusive, as well as live versus VOD, and that really def defines the OTT marketplace. Now, in terms of the exclusive content owner, he has made a tremendous investment. Netflix invests $15 billion, Amazon Prime $6 billion, Apple TV, HBO Max, Hulu, Disney Plus, as well as many, many, many other providers are, are really investing billions and billions of dollars in creating their content. And in order for them to make a profit, they need a return of investment, which means they can't afford for all their great content, whether it's The Good Place or Mrs. Meisel's or, or um, you know, a, a Game of Thrones for HBO Max, uh, Mandalorian for Disney Plus um, to be stolen or offered in the piracy ecosystem because that means a lot of people begin their content for free and it'll be more difficult for them to recoup the, the investment they made in creating this fabulous content. On the other hand, we see in terms of cost of OTT content, we see that the VMVPD, the VMVPD which is the live content distributor, typically is going to charge four times or to five times as much as the SVOD provider, 
which means live content, especially live sports content, is much, much higher value than, than um, SVOD content, even for these great series. So from an exclusive content perspective, we see a huge investment in content, and we see that live content has a higher value than um, VOD content. Now, another phenomenon in the OTT environment place, especially with the direct to consumer marketplace, is that now that um, now that content is is um, is being offered direct to consumer, a lot of the owners of the content want to define their service by that exclusive content. By defining the service by that exclusive content, essentially they will not give the content to aggregators. So if someone wants to really fill his appetite of all the content that he really desires, sports content on live services and different series on different VOD, VOD services, typically they will need to subscribe to three or four different OTT subscriptions. And we see that the number of um, subscribers with even three OTT subscriptions or more is already hitting 30, 40%. Now, this has many, many consequences. One consequence is, is that you see a tremendous amount of churn in OTC services. And here's from Park Associates. You see that there's 35% churn in OTT services compared to 5% of pay TV. Part of it, in pay TV, the service provider was a network provider. And once I bothered to put a satellite dish and, and, and buy a set the box, it's unlikely I'm going to trade it in. And the same goes for cable. But part of it is because um, there are so many subscription, what's called subscription stacking. As soon as an OT, as I find the seasonal series which I enjoy from this OTT provider is finished, I immediately will leave that provider and go elsewhere. As soon as another aggregator will offer the content for cheaper, I might as well leave one aggregator and join the subscription service of another aggregator. And that is one of the consequences of subscription stacking that we see, which is this huge, huge churn. But the primary consequence we see, oh, let me go back, is this, is that the only place for a subscriber today to receive all the desired content that he desires is on a subscription pirate network. All these new subscription pirate networks are basically what they're doing is, is they're stealing content in many of the ways that Ilka presented before um, from all these direct consumer services and they're aggregating together. And because they don't pay license fees, they can charge on one hand, one tenth the cost as any aggregator or even direct to consumer. And they offer many, many, much, much more content. They can offer the Mandalorian, and Mrs. Meisel's and Game of Thrones and all this great content along with sports content, whether it's English Premier League live games or NFL live games for a $10 per month subscription. They'll offer recommendation engines and, and, and search engines and cloud DVR and VOD and live just like the best VMVPD or SVOD provider. And because of that, we see that in Europe, for instance, 941 euro, million euro is lost to live sports to piracy a year. Four billion dollars a year is lost, is, is basically is the cost of pirated content access by North American households. We see tens of thousands of Asian Pacific subscribers who are, who, are, who are churning from all their legal services in order to get their content from a pirated service. So one of this huge churn may not only be to another legal service, but it's to the pirated services. We see 12.4 US billion dollars of the predicted revenue by 2024 for credential sharing. If I have three subscription services I'm subscribing to, maybe I'll swap my credential and give you my Netflix credential if you would give me your Amazon Prime credential. We see 4.1 billion breach credentials just in 2019, which means there's a whole new concept of credential stuffing which, which again, Ilker mentioned, where now people are stealing credentials, they're trying them out in all sorts of OTT services, and then they're selling the service. So when I buy the service, I get someone else's credential, which still works without the owner knowing about it. So if I don't have a friend who can share his credential with, I'll buy the credential from the dark web or from the open internet, and then watch the service on someone else's credential without that person knowing. 
And finally, the lost um, in 2018, the total lost value to all these different types of piracy was 29 billion. And as Zilka pre pre presented uh, by 2022, it's likely to go up to 52 billion. So we see that because of this concept of subscription stacking, more and more people are, you know, who want all the content they could possibly desire are finding it in either pirated websites or subscription pirated network, making it harder, harder, harder for those exclusive content owners who create their own content to make a return investment on the billions of dollars that they're investing in creating great content. So the question is, what should OTT uh, service providers do um, in order to survive, in order not to be uh, lose, uh, lose their whole business and lose their shirts, per se, to these pirated subscription pirated networks and pirated websites? So the first thing they need to do, is, or to credential sharing and credential stuffing, that people can access the service for free. So the first thing they need to do is protect their service to make sure that it's very difficult to access the service for free. And this applies to anyone. If there's any service provider who is gonna allow access to their service for free, people will do it and not pay for their service. And so the first thing they need to do is prevent someone from bypassing authorization. And as Matteo mentioned, they need an extremely, extremely strong DRM. And that DRM must have very strong core service protection that to access the service, you need to have your device, you need to pay in order for your device to access the content. And in order to enforce that, there will be a very strong multi-DRM. Um, the second thing they need to do is prevent credential sharing. And if, I, if these service providers typically don't require multi-factor authentication, what they need to do is some mechanism that can detect that credential sharing is happening. And this is something that Cine Media builds as well, which means we can look at any account and we can see that there are different users from different locations looking at different type of contents um, without ever intersecting for, on different IP addresses. And that will tell us that chances are there is an owner and there's several other sharers who he's sharing his content with. And then we can detect that and then possibly you could take action by sending marketing messages um, to the sharer saying what you're doing is illegal, why don't you actually um, subscribe yourself to this type of service? The next thing they do is to prevent credential fraud. And again, credential fraud is an outgrowth of credential stuffing where people are actually buying credentials on the internet of other, of other owners, of other accounts, without that account owner knowing. And again, there are ways, and we have algorithms, uh, machine learning algorithms, to detect that you know, these are a fraudulent activity by looking at, um, again, what devices are watching what content and, and, and doing a cross correlation between the fraudster and the owner. Um, buying, we can buy, you know, we buy credentials ourselves for different OTT providers and try to then build a supervised learning model to figure out which accounts are being affected by credential fraud. And finally, another mechanism is trial fraud. A lot of what people are doing is they join the seven day trial, a 14 day trial, a 30 day trial, and the last day of the trial, they will cancel so they don't have to pay. And then they'll enter a day later with a new identity. And there's all these identity generators on the internet, um, which give you a fake identity with a fake credit card, with a fake address. And people build these programs, just grab the identity from the identity, uh, the identity generator and the first day of every month to join a new trial. And another thing which we're working on is to be able to detect that and make sure that any porn person, no matter what identity he enters, can only join a trial a single time. So protecting your service is critical for every type of content, every type of OTT provider, be it an exclusive linear, exclusive VOD, or a non-exclusive content aggregator. Now, what's important for the exclusive linear and the exclusive VOD um, service provider is also to protect this content. As we saw, that content was invested billions of dollars to create that content, and that content defines the service, that service of the exclusive linear, exclusive VOD owner, someone like the English Premier League, is the only place to get that content live. And if that content is stolen, and you can now get it from pirate networks, 
they're going to lose a huge part of the, their, their subscriber base. So the first thing they need is really, really strong content protection. And that's a strong multi-DRAM, as Matteo mentioned, but with also platform integrity. They have to make sure that um, geo-broken or rooted uh, devices cannot access content. They have to ensure that people can't do screen captures to be able to steal the content. Um, and the strong DRAM with platform integrity will also ensure that um, um, what, if, they, if someone modifies the application, that application will stop working on that device. So a strong DRM, as Matteo mentioned, is critical to prevent, to protect against bypass content protection. The bad news is, is a lot of time, um, as Ilker mentioned, even with the strongest DRM protection, um, you can um, still access the content if, you're authorized, if you have an authorized device. You can use HTCP strippers, you can, you know, on, on a connected TV, you can even take a video of your connected TV and now grab the content and you can copy it or you can what's clone it, um, that content. And now you can then send that content to pirated websites. You can send that content to your pirated subscription network and you can allow millions of people to either pay or watch your content um, um, that was stolen from, from a legal OTT service. So therefore, strong DRM is insufficient to protect your content. You need what's called some active defense. Active defense means that your system should be able to detect when someone's trying to steal the content and immediately uh, react and revocate or um, you know, take some sort of action um, against the, 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 the device, which is trying to um, access your content and clone it and copy it and upload it. So the first thing you could do is you could put a watermark and Ilker described a lot about the watermark and the difference between watermark and fingerprinting. But if you put in a watermark, you know who cloned that content, who copied that content. And by monitoring these pirated websites and pirated um, networks or pirated services, subscription-based pirated services, you could then grab, clip, clip the content, upload it to a detector, detect the watermark, find the ID of the account or the device that cloned the content, and immediately um, turn off that device, which will then turn off the viewing experience of all the pirated viewers on the pirated website or the pirated network. This is very good for live content, but it's not so good for VOD because of VOD, what the pirates typically do is they upload the whole VOD content before they um, distribute it and enable their viewers to see it. So once their viewers can see the content, even if you can see the watermark, it's too late because that content is now has been uploaded and probably copied to many, many pirated websites and pirated networks. So what you can do here is use the analytics. You can have lots of sensors in your set the boxes and your devices and your head end to understand how the different pirates are um, behaving to steal the content. And therefore, once you see that, oh no, this is probably a pirate. He's watching content 24 by seven He's using his HDMI in a certain different way. He's, you know, um, showing other behavior, which is typical of a pirate. You can then turn that device off, hopefully before he upload too much of your VOD content. If a content provider does provide his content to content aggregators, or content was stolen pre-production, and that content appears in a, pi in a pirated network, there's an active defense will not help. And what you need now is not active defense, but what's called proactive defense. Proactive defense is a means of providing intelligence to understand the whole supply chain of these part of the websites, the part of the networks. Who are the resellers and, and, and what IP addresses are their authentication servers and streaming servers on? And you could take proactive action against the pirates. Proactive action means legal action. It means takedown notices to search engines or CDNs or payment gateways, um, or hosting hosting systems, that the more you can learn about the pirate system, the more takedown notices you can apply, possibly to social network like Facebook or Twitch or, or Twitter or uh, YouTube, and enforce that they, they remove that content. So that requires a tremendous amount of proactive intelligence to take the correct proactive actions. It also means IP blocking with ISPs by knowing the IP addresses of the authentications and the streaming servers of the pirate 
you can also block the IP using typical IP reputation mechanisms that cybersecurity companies typically provide and ISPs are forced to enact, um, as well as other actions, uh, legal actions, depending on the, that country. There's also proprietary, advanced proprietary mechanisms you could take to um, actually actively or proactively take down the pirated content, the content, the legal content or the pirated content from these pirate service providers. Finally, if you're an aggregator, you have an existential threat, threat, which is the existence of the pirate aggregator, of the pirate network. If you're a legal aggregator and you pay very huge content fees to aggregate a bunch of content to give to your subscribers, and there's a pirate the network out there who's aggregating content on his own, but he's not paying any content fee, and he can get much greater content at a lower, lower, and offer at a lower price, that existence of that pirated aggregator, that pirated network is a threat to your capability to survive. And your only capability and your only option is to do some sort of proactive disruption against that pirated network and try to take that pirated network down using some of the, men, um, some of the disruption um, activities I talked about before. Um, and if you don't do that, you know, it'll be very difficult for these legal aggregators um, to survive or make money. In terms of content protection, what I talked about before is you can break it into preemptive defense, which is your strong multi-DRAM and your platform integrity. Um, in broadcast and pay TV, it's conditional access. Active defense, which is some combination of watermarking analytics and disrupting the source in real time, especially for live content, um, by, by detecting the watermark and understanding the analytics. And proactive defense is going against the piracy supply intelligence, the piracy supply chain, and we're talking about educational campaigns, legal notices, IP blocking, and also proprietary uh, mechanisms. So a uh, total content protection system will look as follows. You get your intelligence from the data, like analytics inside your system. You get your intelligence from the supply chain data, which can be the whole nature of what a pirate network looks like. It could be your watermark content, which also comes from the supply chain and you supply it to a command to control intelligence system, will then know to take the right action. It could take the action inside the system, which is your active defense and disrupt the source. It could take the action outside the system, which is your proactive defense and take down um, the content either legally or via the IP blocking or, 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 or takedown notices or proprietary mechanisms. So here are some of the disruptions which you could do as actively as DRM revocation, uh, control plane suspension, CDN revocation as Ilker mentioned, um, CDN revocation of colluding devices if you have very intelligent system, and the proactive supply chain is, are things like uh, legal actions, IP blocking, various takedown notices to any, any place in the whole supply chain of the pirate or some advanced capabilities. So we're Cinemedia. Um, we provide most of these capabilities, both the active defense, the proactive defense, the multi-DRAM with platform integrity, as well as the service protection where we can detect credential fraud, credential sharing, um, as well as trial fraud. So that's it. Any, any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for the interesting presentation. Uh, we have one question and the question for you is, uh, do we have any figures on how many credentials worldwide are suffering from credential fraud? So according to Have I Been Pawn, 9.76 billion credentials have been breached the past couple of years. Two, typically 2% 2 of the breached credentials are still active. So that's still a, a, a huge number. We're talking about, you know, uh, you know, tens and tens of million of credentials which are which are still active, um, and and those are the ones which are going the credential stuffing stuffing attacks. Um, it could be six to eight months before an owner realizer realizes that there's an imposter watching a video in his account, and that's because credential stuffing is very different than phishing. In old phishing attacks, you would try to steal my bank account or my credit card number or my credentials to my bank account and the credit card number because you want to do something malicious right away. You want to transfer money, you want to buy a, 
airplane ticket when there were, were such things before the pandemic on, on, on my, on my uh, credit card. And I would notice it right away, but maybe it would be too late. But you know, you're, you're basically doing, you want to do that malicious one-time attack of theft or defamation. In credential stuffing, when I buy a Netflix subscription um, on someone else's account, the last thing I want to do is be noticed because then he may change his password and then I'm blocked. So what I try to do is I try to watch TV in a very you know, surreptitious way, in a quiet way that I don't get noticed. And I, for $10 can, or $5, can watch Netflix for as, for as long as I want and, and hope that, that you know, the uh, owner of the account will never change his password. So, so uh, credential stuffing is happening a lot. We, we, we buy hundreds of thousands of credentials on the internet and then we use it to build our algorithms. That's with um, machine learning and artificial intelligence. M machine learning, right. Our trial fraud, credential fraud, and credential sharing algorithms are all based on machine learning and artificial intelligence because that allows us to understand the data and then find patterns automatically um, to be able to detect which accounts are using sharing and, and, and stuffing. The, the counter protection is much more based on, like Ilker mentioned, uh, fingerprinting and water watermarking and uh, monitoring um, and, and and those capabilities. Okay, thank you. And cyber, and cyber security. From yeah, from, I guess more from a, a legal point of view as well. And and right, and also working with the legal activities and and takedown notices, etc. So, okay. So uh, the, the the main message here is that. A typical, per, you know, OT providers are popping up all over the world. There's 300 of them in, in, in the United States alone. Who knows how many there are in Italy and, and Europe. And, and, and they're all trying to build, you know, these systems with CDNs and, and packagers and data planes and control planes and recommendations and search. And what they don't realize is how many holes are built into the systems. They're unable to watch their service for free and to take their content and there's a lot of holes to patch, and unless they partner with the uh, you know the the rights uh, security providers such as Cinemedia or Akamai or the likes, um, you know they they really may not get the return investment that 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 they plan to make. And piracy, as Ilker mentioned, is a growing growing problem, and it's getting much worse every year. Just during COVID-19, as Ilker mentioned, where people have financial insecurity and plenty of times on the hand and a desperate need to watch the TV shows they watch, we've seen piracy, certain piracy, you know, grow, grow two to three to four times. And also, as Ilker mentioned, you know, once people compromise their, their, their conscience and their ethics and, and, and learn about all these popcorn.coms and, and piratebay.coms and all these great pirate, you know, uh, you know, subscription pirate uh, websites and networks out there, they're, they're not going to go back to paying so quickly. Yeah, that's that's definitely true. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if there are any other questions for the three speakers, yeah, yeah, Ilker, of course. Thanks. May I ask a question to, to Steve? Um, yeah, as you mentioned, definitely. Now, um, the fun thing is, um, the OTT providers, the MVPDs, now they are competing against the pirated stuff. So their user experience now are competing. And then you have to do the whole security thing in a way so it's not disrupting in any way um, like the user experience. Yesterday, you have been joining a really interesting web webinar where also the security architect from Netflix was there. And I, remind, I remember his sayings, okay, do whatever is necessary, but don't interrupt, like, top thing. Well, my question, I'm sorry. Um, can you give us an example on um, proactive um, approach of, you know, disrupting um, examples? So what you have done? So let's say you have, uh, how are you attacking? Um, have you been uh, going against top side vendors or various groups? Have you been able to take them down? Yeah. Are, you, are you able to talk about that? Um, not able to talk about so much. Certain countries allow certain things, 
But, uh, you know, you are absolutely right. When it comes to a disruption, a successful disruption is one that interrupts the user experience, okay? So if you, during the, you know, the overtime of a major sports match, when everyone is watching, you can disrupt that live content right there by taking down an authentic, taking down a streaming server that you know is, is, is the main one, you know, you've just destroyed that pirate's business. So, so how to disrupt is really based on how to make that pirate lose most of his viewers by killing his user experience. And that deals with the when and the how, and, and there's a lot of intelligence. If you can go through, you know, if a legal action takes six years for the company, or if, a, you know, if you take down an IP and he has six other IPs waiting in the wing and he can respond right away, you know, you've taken action, but you haven't done much. Mm -hmm. So the proactive approach is all about interrupting the user experience in a way they can't recover very quickly and his viewers are totally pissed off. I agree. Okay, thank you everyone for uh, your time and the great presentation, very insightful. We will make this uh, recording available via VOD, so stay tuned, we'll send out a message to everyone. And thanks again, I really wish you a good night and see you soon. Thank you. And bye-bye.